John from FastXBlog.com here. Today I want to set you through 19 things I do to really help me get a lot more content out the door faster, trying to be really, really efficient in this business. All right. The thing to keep in mind is we, we are smaller publishers and we're faced, we're faced with some stiff competition, big companies, seemingly unlimited resources. And so we need every advantage we can get. And in my view, speed is something we have an advantage with because the bigger the organization, often the slower they are in terms of making decisions, making changes, and getting things done just because there's more bureaucracy and overhead and all the rest of it. So we need to embrace speed and use it as a competitive advantage. So the first thing, in my view, that's very, very important with getting a lot more done sooner is make decisions fast. Procrastinating decision making will result in getting nothing done. It's also known as procrastination. You don't want to do that. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. You can fix mistakes. This is not surgery. This is not high, high profile, big stakes litigation. This is publishing websites. You make a mistake and go back, fix it, right? So keep that in mind. Making mistakes is going to be normal. It's going to happen. I make them all the time. Another example is don't overthink your article topics that you need to cover. I know I, I talk a lot about keyword research and how important it is and how to go after, uh, for, for what I do, uh, low competition, easier to rank keywords. But, but don't overthink this. Don't, don't spend so much time trying to d decide between one, two, and three articles that by the time you make a decision, you could have written all three of them. You, know, you don't want to make that mistake. You want to just get it done and at the same time do a good job. So... Tip number one, make your decisions fast. Do not procrastinate. Number two, cherry pick article topics and niches. This is something I never did in the beginning, and this is something I, I do now. Okay, most niches, if they're reasonably sizable, are going to literally have thousands of potential decent keywords and topics you can publish about. And this tip is particularly the case if you're doing a lot of the writing yourself. Choose the easiest articles to write. Choose cherry pick the stuff that you can that that you can write well. Maybe because it's you have experience or interest, or it's a type of article you just manage to do well. I mean, all else being equal, if you're choosing between two topics, you might as well go with the one that's the easiest for you to write, or is the fastest to write, or whatever. Choose wisely and just keep doing that stick with stick with what's easiest for you eventually down the road perhaps you're going to outsource or maybe you've exhausted a lot of the low-hanging fruit then then you can tackle some of the more difficult stuff to produce you know some articles that i've published over the years have taken days and days and days to produce in some cases weeks and other articles i can publish in an hour so that you know some really are easier to do than others and i and this same principle applies to choosing niches you know if you're if you've boiled it down to three or four niches and you're just really not sure choose the niche that's easiest for you to operate in you might as well i mean you know if it's easy for you chances are you you have an interest in it or at the very least you have extensive experience in it and so that you can generate the content very quickly so you know go down the path of least resistance focus on whatever is easiest and fastest especially in the beginning Hopefully you can build your revenue up and get an outsourcing budget and you can you can then hire someone to help with the more complicated work. Number three, I focus on doing and completing one big push each day. That's it. And I say this not only because it helps me actually get some pretty big high impact tasks done every day and every week. But I'm also realistic about what I can actually achieve in a day. I, 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 I've learned over the years that, listen, I'm not going to get 15 things done in a day. I'm going to get one big, important, critical task done. I'm going to deal with a bunch of little leftover things and some administrative stuff. And, th and that's really about it. I try to be realistic about what I can get done. And that allows me to just focus on getting that one really important thing done. Now, if you're getting started or, or if you're still writing most or all of the content for your sites, your most important task that you could do on any given day is getting another article or two out the door. And it's really, I know, it depends on how much time you have. Some people might only have an hour a day. Some people might have only a few hours a week. Some people might have eight or ten hours a day. So it's going to obviously depend on how much time you can, you can spend on this stuff. But really, the, no matter how much time you have, Focus it on the most important tasks. If it's getting content out the door and you're not hiring or working with writers, 
That means it's focusing on writing content, getting it out the door. If you do have a lot of writers and you don't really need to do so much of it, then you need to identify what the next most important task is. Obviously, you're probably publishing more content. So in my view, uh, keyword research would be very important and you can perhaps spend a little bit more time on it and do a, a better job on it. Now, if you're into link building and trying to rank for more competitive keywords, another option is to focus on some really good, effective link building. That's a very time consuming process. It's a high impact ta uh, task or, or process in this business. I tend to not do it. I tend to just focus on the content side of things, but I totally recognize that going out and getting links from other websites, legitimate links is a very effective method as well. So you need to constantly be thinking about, okay, what are the, what is the, the, the task or two tasks that I can do on any given day that's going to get me the biggest results and then try to do at just at least one of them each day. And then you have some time left over, hopefully. You can deal with all those little things that you know aren't super important, but eventually do need to get done. Next up, content briefs. If you are outsourcing content, do not order content without them. They will save you a ton of time. Now they do take time to put together. I have content briefs for pretty much every type of article. Now I, I change up my, my content briefs or ordering templates based on the article concept rather than the niche. And this allows me to use the same template for a particular type of article across any niche. Sometimes I need to make some slight adjustments, but for the most part, I can do it. I, I can just use it as is and just change the whatever the topic is for that particular niche in instructions to the writer. So this is really worth doing. I spent quite a bit of time over the years honing my, my instruction templates for writers. And now I'm able to order a lot of content very, very quickly just relying on these briefs. And, and when I introduce a new type of article or a new article concept into any of my sites, if it's going to be something I'm going to use more than once or it's going to fall into my entire workflow for my site, I'm going to create a new template for that. I, I typically wouldn't create the template until I'm pretty sure it's going to be something I'm going to do regularly. When I do the very first one, I'm going to spend time creating the first instructions and then see how the whole thing works out. So, you know, don't just do it for every type of article you think you might do. Wait until you're actually doing it and it's an article that works on your website. And speaking about articles that work on your website, some of the best data that you can rely on for decision making is looking at what's working on your website. What type of articles are working? What, what length is working? What sort of specific topics within your niche are working? Look at that data and that's going to help you make decisions in terms of where you should go in the future with uh, topic direction. Next up, if in doubt, write and publish. I've already talked about this seriously. If wh whether you have some writers working with you and you're still writing or you are writing everything, if, if you don't really know what the next thing you should be doing and you find yourself doing little tinkering things or just reading on the web or reading blog posts, all these procrastination tasks, just snap yourself out of it and write an article. You get one article out the door you've done your big push for the day. And then if you want to spend the next hour or something tinkering and, and reading and doing that sort of stuff that doesn't really add to your bottom line, by all means, go for it. I mean, we all, we all take breathers. We all do that stuff. I certainly do. And I reserve that for once I've got my big push done for the day. Use the same theme and plugins across multiple sites. Now, if you're just getting started, I do not recommend that you try to grow two, three, four, five websites at the same time, unless you have a huge, huge budget and you can build out a team instantly, then you can tackle multiple sites. If it's just you, you really should focus on one, one website. It's a lot of work to get one website off the ground. Focus on that. Once it's, once it's performing really, really well, generating really good revenue, then you could start thinking about diversifying with another website. So let's assume you have two websites or three or five or whatever number. In my view, in my experience, it's saved me a lot of time to just use the same theme and the same fleet of plugins on every site, set them up pretty much the same way. And that way, when I need to make any changes or updates or do anything to it, I can just open them all up in a tab and I can just rip through one by one like an assembly line, do it all, it's done quickly. I also become very, very familiar with the particular theme I'm using. So it takes a lot of the guesswork and contacting support and looking at 
support documentation and all that. I don't have to do any of that. For usually, it doesn't take me very long. I've got a really good understanding of how everything works, and I can make my own changes quickly and do them myself rather than wait for somebody else to do them. Next, this is a new development in my workflow right in Classic Editor Publishing Gutenberg. What do I mean by this? Okay, well, WordPress has the old Classic Editor that we've been using for years and years and years. And then a few years ago, WordPress launched this whole new editor page builder called Gutenberg with Gutenberg Blocks. Okay, it's awesome. I like it. This is in by no means a comment about me not liking Gutenberg at all. But, but I do prefer to write and format for as much as I can in Classic Editor and then do the final uh, styling and publishing in Gutenberg. Okay, so Classic for me is just easier to use. I find most of the people on my team do prefer Classic and so we use it. So I, I did a big push to switch to Gutenberg. I, I trained every, everybody who deals with my websites on using Gutenberg and which blocks I want to use and where to use them and all this stuff. That, that was quite a process. And I'm very happy with Gutenberg, and I use Gutenberg uh, page builders for home pages and, and other pages. And so, you know, I kind of sort of had this purist mentality, and purist mentalities can often work against you. And so it was going to be like Gutenberg or bust. We're going to just use Gutenberg from, from start to finish. And I was doing, my, you know, writing content. I still write content for various sites, and I was formatting some content. And I just always defaulted to classic. I, I actually published and wrote lots of articles in Gutenberg. I just found it cumbersome. I found I had to use the mouse and click and move things way too much. And it just totally, totally interrupted my, my workflow and my writing. And I just, by default, just started using classic. I like it better. Most of the people who I work with prefer it. And so I just send out an email, said, listen, you know what? We can, we can construct and, and put all the content together in classic. Then we can just convert it over to Gutenberg at the end, insert whatever Gutenberg blocks we're using, like the Gutenberg uh, simple TOC table of contents, any schema we need to add via the blocks and so forth, and then publish the post as Gutenberg. And that's worked really, really well, and it's sped up the process for everyone. And so just don't, don't have the purest mindset. Go for the faster, easier methods if it's possible. Okay, checking stats does not make you more money. A lot of people, and I am included in this years ago, I used to spend way too much time every day refreshing analytics for traffic levels on current day, especially in that real-time view, and of course, any ad revenue networks, okay? Now, most ad networks these days don't show you revenue until the following day, so you can't really just sit there and pound away and look at how much your revenue is going up in a given day, but when I used AdSense way back when, your AdSense uh, revenue would grow throughout the day, like literally minute by minute. So you could just sit there and refresh, 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 and watch your AdSense go up. Now, that was kind of fun, but it didn't do anything for my business. It it didn't grow traffic. It didn't grow revenue. It just was a, a waste of time, really. But And so I know in analytics, you can do the same thing. You can see your traffic throughout the, the day and not only is the time that you spend on it a waste of time, it, it, it disrupts any workflow you have, but most importantly, it puts you on an emotional roller coaster, especially if you do that real-time traffic thing, and then you notice it's like, oh, wow, it's 9 a.m. Tuesday, and um, I have eight view, uh, visitors less at this time than I did last week. Oh, no, my site's going down the tubes. What's going on? You dive in, and then you get distracted, and you start looking for problems, and then maybe you implement some changes that you really shouldn't have made because it's really based on not even close to enough data. And before you know it, you've wasted a whole hour on something that's probably nothing, and it just happens to be a slight anomaly where your traffic happened to be a little bit lower for one particular hour out of the week compared to last week, and it's meaningless. So I tend to avoid all of that throughout the day. I, I do check analytics and, and revenue accounts. Uh, anywhere from three to five times a week. Uh, I, I think it's important you do need to stay on top of this. Don't completely disregard it because if there are some big swings on any given day or week, you know, that may be an indication of something's working super, super well. And that could be some more opportunities or it could be an or maybe things start going down quickly. That could be an indication there's a problem that you need to take a look uh, into. 
All right, take the guesswork out of content optimization. This is huge for me. This has helped not only me and my sites, but it's also helps the writers who work on my sites. And basically what it is, it's using content optimizers. Uh, two, bi two big ones in the industry would be Market Muse and Surfer SEO. I've used both. Both are very good and you can rely on them. And basically what they do is they give you a lot of little helpful tips on optimizing your content based on content that's already ranking in Google. So they look at the, the top ranking uh, articles, it might be the top 10 or 20 or 30, and it'll look at like a word count, it'll look at the different words used, the phrases used, number of headings used, questions, images, everything you could really drill down and look for this stuff. I tend to not get that detailed about it. I tend to focus on basically additional words or topics that should be added to the article as well as word count. And Market Muse has a really nice feature where they also suggest the various questions that are tightly related to the particular topic. And I find those helpful. Um, Market Muse has its own algorithm, so they come up sometimes with fairly unique stuff, and I like that. And so writers will use these tools uh, when they're working on articles that are assigned to them. And it helps them too. It helps them come up with additional topics and subtopics that they need to add to the article. It certainly guides all of us in terms of word count. Now, I say all of that about content optimizers with a grain of salt. Is this going to guarantee you number one rankings for all your articles? No, it will not. These are merely guides. There's no guarantee you're here. This, this is something that maybe will give you a slight advantage with your content. It is not a sure thing. And so that's how I view it. And for me, you know, it, when you're publishing a lot of content over the course of a month and a year, every slight advantage you can get is going to help and add up in the long run. Do I have empirical proof and data to show you that using Market Muse for my articles has resulted in higher rankings? No, I don't have that. I don't track this up that carefully. The concept makes sense to me, and so I'll use it, and I'll spend money on it, and I'm happy to pay writers to spend time to use it as well. I think overall on the balance, it helps with content. And in fact, the interesting thing is, and this occurred to me, occurred to me very, very recently, and that is, I believe, or at least for me, what's happened is using these content optimizers is saving me a lot of money because I used to order articles just with pretty uh, high word counts without really investigating really what, what would be needed. And so now what I do is I order articles on the topics based on the suggested word count by Market Muse for that topic, and which is which is really cool because in the past I may have ordered 1,800 words for a particular topic, but Market Muse suggests perhaps 900 will do it. So maybe I'll just hedge a little bit and and add, add a add a cushion and make it 1,000 for the order. Whereas in the past I'd order 1,800, so I've saved myself a considerable amount on a particular article, and I, I, I know I'm getting a lot more content out the door for the same or less money using content optimizers. So that's a really big benefit with it, and, and I certainly don't think it's compromising the content output whatsoever. Next, avoid scheduling anything. Okay, this is, this is a personal preference. I like a blank schedule, period. And, and I'm really talking about phone calls, Skype calls, Zoom meetings, anything like that, okay? I find them to be very, very distracting, disruptive, and generally speaking, a big waste of time. Now, do I 100% avoid it? No, of course not. I do schedule calls here and there. I do schedule, I do interviews here and there. And so these things do come up. Uh, but whenever I can, if I'm asked, almost always my default answer is sorry. I, I don't schedule meetings. I don't schedule calls. I don't mean to be, I, I don't really belabor it and explain why. I just say, no, sorry, I can't do that. Uh, but, you, you know, please email me the details, okay? So, and then if they email me the details and then I, it's something that I really want to pursue and I'm motivated enough to actually book a call to pursue that, then I will. So I really, you know, it takes a while for me to eventually book anything that involves a telephone or anything that's a live meeting situation. And that has saved me a lot of time. Here, here's an example, right? Let's say I've got a, a, a 20 minute uh, Skype call booked with somebody and it's, it, it's, it's in two hours. Well, the reality is, is because I've got that call and it's sort of this cloud hanging over me, I'm probably just not, for whatever reason, it doesn't make any logical sense, I'm probably not going to start anything serious 
inside an hour before that call because I know it's going to get interrupted. And so it throws the rhythm of my entire day off. And that's particularly the case if these calls end up getting booked during my three to five hour sweet spot, which is my big push time, which is usually in the morning. And so I know all this and I know I've got those three to five hours in the morning where, I, where I'm able to get the most important work done. And I, I protect that time very, very much and, and because I just, if that gets interrupted, it's going to throw the whole day off and I, and I may not get that big push done. So, so there's a lot of reasons behind this. This is a personal preference. It's certainly by no means the, you know, if you don't, if you don't do this, you're not going to get anything done sort of thing. Some people thrive on phone calls. Some people love just taking a break and yakking away and, and meeting other people and all that. And, and if that's the case, by all means, you know, it works for you. And I don't, I don't mean to come across to probably sound like some curmudge, curmudgeon guy who doesn't like talking to anybody, but it's, it's not really that. Um, often these, these scheduled calls are various merchants or, or people I'm really likely never going to really talk to bef- again. And, you know, it's a sales pitch of some sort, and very likely it's not, not going to be something I'm interested in. And so for me, I just don't see that it's a good use of my time, and I just don't like things on the schedule. So, um, you know, each to our own in this regard, but for me, my preference is definitely keeping my schedule as clean as possible, especially during that, that big push, important three to five hours in the morning. All right, I've mentioned this many, many times, and I'm sure most of you already know this, it's obvious, but multiple moder- monitors is a must-have. I, I, it's not only in this business, it's any business where you're using a computer. I mean, to have, be able to have two, two screens, two full windows open, rather than navigating different tabs, um, it's just a game changer with productivity. Uh, if you have a laptop, you can easily add a, a low-cost monitor. Monitors aren't very expensive these days. It just takes a, like an HDMI cord, and you're up in business. For me, it's got to probably be at least a 30 to 50% increase in productivity adding the second. I actually have uh, a total of, well, I have three monitors. The third is one of those widescreen curve things, which is really cool for spreadsheets because I can really stretch them. And it's probably a bit excessive, but I, I do honestly use all three monitors pretty much all day long. I find it very helpful. Google Sheets, Apple Notes, and Google Calendar. Yeah, I sound like a, a big uh, Google Apple fanboy here. Uh, I, I mentioned these three because these are basically the three free pieces of software I use to run everything. I don't pay for fancy project management software. I've tried a lot of them. I've tried ClickUp. I think I've tried Trello, I've tried Evernote, I've tried all sorts of stuff. At the end of the day, all I need is a spreadsheet, which Google provides for free, and it's really good, and it's instance, it's on the cloud, I can access it anywhere with through my account, I, even on my phone, although spreadsheet on a phone isn't the most fun to use. Apple Notes is, is just an absolutely awesome, simple little note-taking thing where you can search it, you can add notes, I can access my same notes from my phone, from any computer, and it's fast. And I basically create all my little to-do lists in there. I take all sorts of notes, like it's all keyword research, uh, or keyword searched, you know, so I can find things, it's, it's, and it's free, it's with Apple. If you don't use Apple, you can find uh, the substitute. I think Google has something very, very similar, and that too is free. So this is pretty much what I use to run my business. Yes, I appreciate my, my uh, a little bit ironic, I list Google Calendar for somebody who doesn't like to schedule anything. But, you know, I do have to schedule things here and there. And I, and I actually, I have a separate uh, calendar for for some of, um, for my business from personal. And that makes it a little bit easier for me to see what's going on when I'm working versus uh, personal uh, stuff. So anyways, Google Calendar, free, accessible everywhere. I'm sure you know about all these different software. My point here is, is you don't need to pony up the 10 or 20 bucks a month for super fancy project management software to be able to run multiple websites and, and do well in this business. And in fact, I've tried them. I, I wanted them to work. I, I spent, I think, two or three days setting up ClickUp, doing all the stuff, adding my sites, getting everybody onboarded, to training videos, the whole nine yards. And I think after three days, I emailed them and I said, you know, do you, are you liking this? Is it helping? And they said, no, not really. Kind of like just the old spreadsheet system. And I said, yeah, me too. Okay, so we shut it down. So there you go. But you know what? I, I have friends in this business who love that software and it works really, really well for, me, for them. And at the end of the day, I am a very unorganized person. My stuff is not organized. I could probably benefit with somebody setting the, all this up for me and running it and getting things more organized. So there you go. I, I'm comfortable being 
disorganized with pretty much everything I'm running and it just seems to work for me. All right, deal with emails the first time I open them. Okay, this is just one of those little little productivity. I don't even want to say it's a hack. It's almost sort of self-evident. But I think a lot of us, including me, by default, we will look at emails and it's like, oh, I don't really want to deal with this right now. We close it. We go to the next one. Okay. So, I mean, I've, I've done that a lot. But I have also learned that if I can just, if, if, if I can respond to it, I don't need additional information. I don't need more time. I can respond to it. The best thing is to just do, just get it done. Do the response, move it out, it's off. Okay, so uh, the exception would be if I need to, to need more time because I'm waiting on something to give them proper information. And following up on email, I find using um, starring important emails, especially like on weekends or when I'm away and I'm not really dealing with work and I don't want to don't want to reply to emails or anything like that. I can tell right away whether it needs a response or whether it doesn't. I often I don't even have to go into them. And so I'll just star them. And then when I do get to the desk and I'm, I'm in work mode, I can just filter by stars. And there they are. There's the 10 or 20 that I need to deal with. The rest of the emails I don't have to deal with. And it just helps me find these and deal with these very quickly. I should follow up on the whole email thing. I'm not, I'm not like a, a power Gmail user. I'm not a power email productivity hack guy at all. These are just two little simple things I found useful for me. I have over 400,000 emails in my Gmail inbox. It's basically become like a database. I actually use it. I search for all sorts of stuff. It's like I, I, I know I had that email that said this or attached this three years ago. Uh, I'll look for it and I'll find it. And 99 out of 100 times, I actually do find this old stuff. Uh, but once in a while, I don't. So um, develop your own ways to do email. It, it can be a time suck, but you know, email is also... I a lot of my business moves forward with email. So, and I'm sure the same is with you. Next up, 99% of my instructions that I send to anybody, whether it's a training a writer, whether it's training a, a VA, anyone, social media, I do it as a video. I like Loom videos. Uh, I think they have a free plan and the paid plan is pretty cheap. It renders the videos quickly, but anything that you can do screen share videos with will do the job. I used to sit there and type out instructions line after line after line and just about go crazy. And also the person that trying to follow this is going crazy and inevitably they'd be like, what do you mean by this? And back and forth, back and forth before, you know, they actually finally like, oh, okay, I get it. Boy, you know what? A two minute video would have solved that problem back then. So now all my instructions, unless it's like one sentence or two sentences, I, I get sent by video. It'll save you so much time. You can crank out instructions like crazy really, really quickly to anyone. And they'll appreciate it because they just got to follow along. Another little tip that's going to save you time in the long run if you use any sort of affiliate promotion is you got to learn how to speed up affiliate link creations. There is nothing worse than having to sit there and create affiliate links. It's really, really boring, especially when you're, when you're part of five different affiliate networks like CJ.com, ShareASale, Impact. I think there's Pepper Jam out there. There's ClickBank. There's a whole bunch of them, Okay. I really worked hard to just minimize and eliminate as much of this work as possible. And I found three ways and three tools to do this. The first one is skim links. Anything that involves like physical product merchants and almost any niche, they're with skim links for the most part. And with skim links, the reason I like them so much, I don't do their, their option where you can have uh, all, all your merchants converted into a skim link on your site. I don't do that. That's turned off. What I use skim links for is creating a a custom affiliate link for any of my merchants to any particular product very, very quickly. With, with skim links, it's almost instant, and I like that. And in fact, it's so easy to do. I've trained my, my VA to, to go in and create uh, links and skim links, and it's very simple for them to do. They don't have to learn five different affiliate networks. They just got to know where to go in the toolbox and skim links. They can take the URL for the product that they're linking to, put it in there, convert it to a skim link, affiliate link, done, and it, put it in the website. They're done and it's great. Fast for them, fast for me. Thirsty Affiliates is ideal. It's a it's a affiliate link cloaker. It's ideal when you promote the same 10, 20, 30 merchants throughout your website. And the reason it's so ideal is if any of those merchants where you probably have, let's say, 5, 10, maybe 100 different instances of links on your site to them, promoting them, they go ahead and they change affiliate networks, which means the affiliate links change. Now, I can tell you from personal experience... It's not a good day when you have to comb through a website changing 
100 different links on across 35 different blog posts because uh, a merchant you promote decided to change affiliate networks. It's not a good day. So Thirsty Affiliates avoids that. All you need to do is you need to change the affiliate link in one little entry in there, and then it changes that, that, uh, that link across your entire website. So very, very handy tool. I use the free version. The free version offers pretty much everything you're going to need, and so it's a no-brainer for me. Now, keep in mind, it only works if you promote the same merchants over and over and over, the same product o products over and over. If you, you know, I have other sites where I, I promote hundreds, maybe thousands of different products. It all depends on the article itself. Thirsty Links isn't a good solution for that. <clears throat> Lastly, I've mentioned this one many, many times, AMC Images. It's the fastest, easiest, lightest method for embedding properly within Amazon's TOS images from Amazon, any product in your website. They also can be formatted to be quite large. It's just really an ideal plugin for getting images from Amazon on your website. And you can even take it a step further if you want to get the URL for that particular image. Uh, sorry, for, for the link to the product within Amazon. You can just edit the image, you can grab that link, and then you can add that within text below. So it's so quick to insert the images and get a feeling link. So it's, it's, it's a really great little plugin. It does one thing and it does it really well. All right, next up, uh, get coding help after 10 minutes, okay? I've, I have spent weeks trying to figure out CSS in the past. Now, this was well before page, page builders hit the scene. So um, I'll use that as my defense. But no, you know, seriously, I wasted weeks when I probably could have done a million different things that would have, would have been, been a much better use of my time. And I don't think I even figured it out. And this is simple CSS. Listen, I don't know CSS well at all. I don't know HTML all that well. I don't know PHP at all or JavaScript at all. I have no idea. If, if anything in, of this stuff needs to be changed or I need any sort of coding help, it, I don't like paying the 100 or 150 bucks or 200 bucks to someone on Codable or Upwork or somewhere. Maybe, maybe you have access to somebody who can code for better rates. Uh, I certainly don't like paying for that, but you know what? Often they can generate the, the whatever little code I need in minutes in minutes because they know how to do it. They train for it. Now, if you want to train and you really want to learn PHP because you, you know, maybe you want to start coding plugins or something or JavaScript or whatever, by all means, spend the time learning it. But if you're really focusing on publishing, you don't need to know this stuff. You can always find someone who can help you out. But more importantly, ask yourself, do you really need the code changes or tweaks or whatever that you're looking for? Is it just some style preferences that you're looking for? Is it really worth the 100 bucks at this time or the 200 bucks to hire a coder? Most cases, probably not. I know for me, often it wasn't. There have been some PHP things I needed that were pretty important, and that was worth it. Um, but in terms of like styling, you know, seriously, ask yourself before you shell out this money, or worse, spend two weeks trying to figure it out on your own. Ask yourself if you really need it, because chances are you probably don't. All right. Next up, this is this is a little bit one of the, one of those difficult tips, but. You know, stop learning the stuff you don't need to know, okay? It's, it's so easy to spend way too much time reading about the stuff, whether it's SEO, whether it's, oh, the better business model online. Maybe you're into website publishing, but things aren't happening as quickly as you'd like, and then you see, you read about these people making a killing selling products on Amazon, and you start thinking about that, so you go buy a course on that, and then you, 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 you turn your back on, on the content publishing part, and you start up this selling on Amazon thing. Three months later, you haven't really much made much headway to that. You think, well, I, I think I like content publishing. And you could go round and round like that for years. And usually I find it's because you're probably, and, and I've been there, I've, I've done a lot of bright, shiny object uh, rabbit holes over the time, over the years. I've, I've ditched websites that were starting to make track, get some traction. And I move and do something else, which went nowhere. I wasted months. And you can do this little merry-go-round for years and years and years. Here's the thing. If you get something that's working, it doesn't matter what it is. You don't have to do this uh, content publishing niche website thing. There's lots of things that work in, in this online business. Email marketing, e-commerce, um, more affiliate marketing, whatever it is, all this stuff can work. If you get something that's working, that's generating even a little bit of revenue consistently from your efforts, that's not the time to start 
thinking, oh, this isn't happening fast enough. No, you actually have something that's working. It's time to scale that. It's rinse and repeat. It's what I call you, now you're now you've got to boring because now you're going to do basically the same thing over and over and over. You're going to scale that, and that's how you're going to grow your revenue. So, you know, get get to where you can get something working, and then decide. And and I tell you, if it is working. Count yourself lucky because a lot of people don't get to a stage in this business where it's actually working, where it's spitting out revenue consistently. That means you've done something. If you if you could spit out a dollar a day, there's no reason you can't spit out two and then four and then eight and so forth. So, you know, double down on what's working and really avoid constantly reading stuff that's that's going to that's going to make you try something else that's totally unrelated. Now, I say all that with a grain of salt because it's also important to stay up to date with what you're doing with, with, you know, maybe the, maybe you're into content publishing. Well, for me, I'm into content publishing. That's what I do. I disregard anything that has to deal with e-commerce or, or FBA, which I think is fulfillment by Amazon or, or any of that stuff. I focus on content publishing. If I see any information that pertains to good keyword research, especially uh, long tail keyword research or any on-site SEO, I pay attention and I'll read that stuff and I want to stay on top of that because that's right on point with what I'm doing. And so I do pay attention. I do buy the occasional course. I usually don't have high expectations, but if I learn a thing or two, it's money well spent because that one or two tips that I find useful could, could have a big impact on my website. So it's really, it's a balancing act, but try to really restrict what it is you're, you're learning and you're putting time into learning to anything that's only really on point with what you're doing. Okay, bookkeeping. Yeah, well, I I was on the fence whether to include this, but I think it's important, okay? You know, when you get started, when I got started, I, I didn't have a corporation. I haven't an LLC even. Uh, well, I'm in Canada, so we don't have LLCs. But anyways, it, it, basically, I just treated it like a personal hobby. <laughs> it's, you know, I think hosting was paid on a personal credit card. It was all mixed in with my, my personal checking account. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really sort of set out and treat this like a business. It, it was just a sort of little thing I was doing. And I had no idea where it was going to go, but that's how it was. And so, you know, trying to come tax time to try to figure out well what was an expense for business and that sort of thing wasn't the easiest thing to do but I kind of just limped along like that for for some time and eventually you know I wisened up and and probably the easiest thing you can do if you're not quite ready to incorporate or do the LLC thing or anything like that and and do consult lawyers and accountants when you think you're ready for this for those next formal steps but the easiest thing you can do really is just get a separate credit card where you're going to run your expenses and a separate PayPal account for for your online activities for the business stuff and that's going to make it very easy for you to quickly you know figure out you know what was your now, uh, revenue and earned from your online businesses and your expenses, and it just helps the accounting be a lot easier. And if you want to take one step further and make your life easier with accounting, is just get QuickBooks. It's fairly inexpensive. If you have some revenue coming in, it's probably worth doing. It'll help with the whole at the end of year tax preparation. And you know what? If you're going to pay an accountant to do all this work, the the less work and time that they need to do the stuff. Uh, the better, and a 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month that QuickBooks costs is probably going to be well worth every dollar you spend if you save even one hour of accountant's time at, at year end. Well, that's a wrap. That is a quick list of, I guess, tips. I don't even want to say they're hacks. There's, not, there's nothing really magical about this stuff. It's just things I've sort of learned over the years to help me just get more done and understand really how much I can get done and you know, know, know the limitations of realistic expectations, what to focus on at any given time, how I want to structure my day. These are all important. They all help me get more done at any given time. And really, when, when it comes to lists like these, there's probably nobody in the world where they're going to resonate with the same 19 that I've set out. You know, it's not like this is some mandates. Like if you don't follow all 19, you know, you're never going to get anything done. It's ridiculous. You know, if, if at best two of them resonate with you and you're like, oh, that makes sense. I kind of like that idea. Then it would, then it, then it's, then it's worthwhile. You, you got something out of it. So don't think that, you know, oh, well, I have to now do all 19. No, you don't, you know, just cherry pick a couple that you think make the most sense to you and go with it. Thanks for watching.